I'm fine. Okay, good. Well, I'm very lucky here because I've had two excellent talks beforehand that have given everyone the nuts and bolts uh, from a more mechanistic perspective uh, from Francesca and now uh, from a more functional physiological perspective from Katerina, uh, linking uh, both function with uh, molecular patterns. So, so, so I hope that this means when I, I explain here uh, or present some results, I'm not going so much into details. So effectively, um, of course, when we look at these larvae and we look at these very short time periods of treatment, it's almost unbelievable that changes so early on and for such a short duration could have an effect in an adult nine months or a year or two years later. And so in a way that the that's what I want to try and uh, present today and to try and show that actually, despite only perhaps being exposed during the egg stage or being exposed during the autotrophic phase to changes in temperature or to changes in nutrition or other regimes, this can be enough to cause a, a lasting effect and that that lasting effect, in fact, could be used uh, as a means to improve or modify the quality uh, or characteristics of the product. So effectively here, what I've tried to do is put this into the context of aquaculture. I mean, the big, the, the big uh, compelling issue for someone that's producing fish is can you supply enough? Can you supply the demand and can you make a profit from that? And, and there are many, many different factors we know in, that will inter, interact and, and affect that. But we feel that from the hatchery perspective, and considering how we can use environmental conditions that we perhaps can modify quality and, and, and generate a, a product which might match better the demands of the consumer or might match better the demands of the grow out manager, you know, depending on, on where the emphasis is placed. So does manipulating hatchery stage modify the added quality? Is this a truth or a myth? And is this based on this exploiting the biological plasticity? So I'm not going to try and, and identify epigenetics marks. I'm just going to give you this general perspective again that we know, and as Francis showed us, uh, there are mechanisms that are outside of the genome or the genetics. There are mechanisms that manipulate or modify the genome expression and that that actually can have a very big effect, sometimes even more than the gen direct genetic effect on the phenotype. And so, so this is what we wanted to try and do. So we've got a similar genotype, we've got a different environment, we get a different epigenome, and that gives us a different phenotype. And so that's what's basically summarized on, on this uh, Waddington's landscape map with the broodstock, the resulting eggs, and then according to the trajectory that these different eggs and early larvae take, they may end up producing fish with quite a different phenotype. And can we use that therefore in the hatchery as a means, as Katerina raised, to conduct precision farming or perhaps to produce a fish at a later stage, which is more resistant to disease. So again, Katerina highlighted that there are many factors that can interplay here. Of course, temperature is, is easy and straightforward because fish do not regulate temperature and therefore changes in temperature are going to have quite some effect on the uh, embryo, on the larvae and on subsequent stages. So that's what we looked at. But of course, nutrition, as Katerina highlighted, salinity, hypoxia, pathogens, xenobiotics, anything that's early exposure has the potential to modify a series of physiological traits and characteristics that do influence, uh, therefore, the productivity potentially uh, of of industry. Uh, and so uh, the conceptual basis here, therefore, was this question again, if we can we modify the adult phenotype by manipulating the embryo larval epigenome uh, by modifying their environment, and in this case, using temperature. So what I'm presenting are two little case studies here, uh, just to give you two different perspectives, both are on uh, sea bass, they're coming from two different projects, we built the perform fish based on some of the outcomes of the sushi fish. This was all conducted in collaboration with industry to really try and in fact uh, do experiments that have relevance uh, at an industrial level because obviously one of the problems is experimental work carried out in labs doesn't always suit 
the purpose for, for industry because it's a very different production system. So in the first case study, um, we wanted to do thermal programming and, and the experiment was only done at the egg stage. So, and not subsequently after hatching. And the phenotype that we wanted to look at there in the adult was the fast refeed response. If we fast the animals, then we refeed them. Is the response the same or does it differ according to the thermal treatment that was given in the egg stage? So that was from one project. And the se second case study was specifically coming from Perform Fish. And the question that here was, if we thermal program longer for the egg and autotrophic stage, uh, does that modify uh, the phenotype of, of late juveniles or adults? And in this particular case, because of this major concern with regards to uh, pathogens and disease, uh, we decided uh, to look at an immune challenge there. So these are the two small uh, studies I'll show you. I'm not going to go into all the data. I just want to really demonstrate that actually, yes, changing the thermal regime in an egg or changing the thermal regime in an egg and the autotrophic stage can significantly modify the response of the adult to a challenge nine months later. Um, so, and this is not a modification in the genome. It's not a breeding program. This is really defining conditions, defining how temperature affects subsequent performance. And it does most likely through the epigenome. So this is the first study. Uh, in this particular case, it involved several members from my group and also collaborators in France, Marbec, uh, Marie-Laure Begaud and, and Bastien Sadoul. And what we did was to subject these eggs, and this is the schematic. So the eggs were held at these three different temperatures, 11, 13.5 and 16, slightly different from the performed fish experiment, but to do with the regime used in France. Uh, that was only until uh, hatch, at which point they were all brought up to the same temperature and they passed the next nine, uh, nine months, so probably eight and a half, uh, at exactly the same temperature. This was a common garden experiment. All of them went into the same tanks and were tagged. And then we had replicas of those tanks uh, containing a mixture of tagged fish from the different temperature regimes. We didn't see any significant differences in mortality, weight and length. So we then went on. So, so the, initially we wanted, we'd hoped that this would cause a big difference in growth and that this could be a way of, of taking fish to market sooner, but this was not what we found. So, but we did ask, okay, so we don't see a change in growth, but how about if we expose them to a typical challenge? Maybe they don't get fed on one day. Maybe they don't get fed on two days. Maybe they can't compete well enough for the food. So let's do this fast refeed challenge and let's see um, what happened. So we fasted them for a week and then we refed them and sampled at 10 hours and two days, what I have here. And what did we look at? We looked at biochemical parameters to assess uh, the metabolic status. We looked at cortisol to assess whether there was a stress element here. And then we looked at the liver and intestine, two major metabolic tissues that are involved uh, when we remove food are clearly going to be affected looking at the structure and organization and looking by PCR at the molecular patterns. Uh, what did we see? So again, as I'm telling you, this is a summary of a lot more data. And I, I just want to kind of draw, draw uh, and, and highlight the message using this few data. So we, we measure cortisol, of course, looking for stress. We measure lactate, which is the new so-called strain uh, measure. This is not stress, but it's pushing it to the limit, so lactate. And then we looked at glucose, of course, important metabolic fuel. Um, what we saw was that generally when we're looking at basal levels, in other words, the programming without challenge doesn't seem to have a major impact, at least at nine months when we're trying to measure the fish. The only thing that we could see here, which is highlighted, is lactate. In fact, uh, was quite different. Um, when we look at the higher temperature uh, compared to the normal 13.5 mid temperature. But the difference comes, so, so my conclusion here, so effectively the take home message, when we look at the plasma, the biochemical parameters, as I said, I'm, I've just put a few here, we've analyzed more, is that in general, there was no change in basal conditions. However, we could see a shift in the response of, uh, of cortisol, so the stress response, and that was at two days post-feeding, 
and that the strain uh, response, this is given by the lactate, so we can have lactate producing cells, but we also have lactate consuming gels. This is a new kind of model and concept. Uh, that is quite modified, as you can see, in response to the 10 hours uh, refeeding, but we're also seeing that in starvation. Uh, so, the, the, all, so the application of a temperature challenge uh, for 48 hours in the egg stage causes not a change in basal, so all the fish look similar, but when under stress, there's a very pronounced difference in their response when we look at the biochemistry. How about the morphology? So we're looking here at the liver. We looked at liver intestine. These are two important metabolic tissues. And we look at the seriology. In other words, we try to figure out in terms of a three-dimensional model, you know, are the cell number, is the cell shape, uh, is this changing? And what, what we have in the panel of the histology is sections of the liver, and when they've got this clear uh, region, this represents the fat. And of course, when that disappears, it becomes much pinker because it becomes a cytoplasm. So you can, if you just look at the 13 and 16, you can see that there is actually a difference. Uh, and this is also reflected when we look at the stereology. This is reflected by differences uh, in certain parameters like the lipid area uh, and things like the nuclear number. So again, what was the take home message? The take home message here was that again, when we look at the basal condition, if we compare the liver uh, from fish at 11 degrees, 13.5 and 16, when they were eggs, there doesn't appear to be any big difference between them. But when we challenge them, there is a difference in their capacity to respond. And moreover, that difference varies by tissue. So the liver was much more modified and the intestine um, and that the recovery rather than the fasting is where we see the difference. There's a, a shift in the timing it takes for the fish to recover and there's a shift in the, the characteristics of that recovery. Here we as well we looked at the metabolic uh, response. We didn't look in, I'm only showing again a small pocket, a small picture, a small image of this, uh, phosphokinase for example, PPAR alpha, um, uh, peptidase one, so this is just a small um, Photoshop of, of a, a very large molecular analysis. But again, we came to the same conclusion. We came to the conclusion that when we look at the control, there's a fish that came from the three temperature regimes as eggs. And we look at these enzymes, there don't seem to be any major differences between those three different populations that have been reared together for nine months. But when we challenge them with the fasting and the refeeding, then again, if you look, you can see the significant groups are being highlighted here. Then again, we can see that some of these metabolic uh, genes that will be translated into metabolic uh, proteins that contribute to, to the metabolic process are being significantly modified. And that that modification is related to the regime that they were exposed to as eggs. So challenge modifies the intestine response here at a molecular level more than the liver um, and the, the recovery response when we start to refeed is where we see the biggest difference in response. So the conclusion overall, and we I'm not showing you all the data, I'm just giving you a snapshot, was that in fact the programming for 48 hours in X modified the metabolism and that, that this then is reflected by this shift in the liver when we look at the histology because it's handling fuel is handling the lack of fuel in a different way and that there is a, a change in the capacity to respond to a fasting and refeeding uh, challenge. So as for this first small case study, the, just this thermal regime applied to the egg has a lasting response and is seen at nine months uh, in the juvenile when challenged. The, the thermal imprinting in this experiment uh, and with the food challenge showed us that there was a modified capacity to respond to fasting refeeding, and that this seemed to be linked to the metabolism when we consider the lactate, which is not normally considered to be an important fuel, is being much more utilized by some groups than others. Um, we also saw that there was a shift in the tissue organization or response and the, biochem the plasma biochemistry in response to the challenge. So, what does that say for someone that's working in a hatchery 
one thing we observe often is people are floating eggs off the top of the tank and then they come in in the morning and they grab the eggs and they put them into the incubators. In fact, those eggs, if they're in an unstable temperature, you can see just by modifying temperature at the egg stage, egg incubation stage, this then affects the performance at nine months later. So clearly, uh, early the egg condition and the egg storage and the egg collection is an aspect that's quite important because it can have quite a pronounced effect on the variability in response within uh, a population of fish if they're being exposed to slightly different temperatures. So coming now to the second trial, uh, which was the performed fish, this is very much under uh, study. So this is a very small uh, snapshot. And this was a different experimental regime. Katerina has already discussed how this trial was carried out. I re reproduce that just to remind everyone, but she's detailed for you, you know, basically what the objective was and how we went about doing this. Again, applying the thermal regime, because we know these fish do not regulate temperature. Certainly uh, an egg and an embryo is very exposed to a change in temperature. It's a rapid change in the organism. It's very small. The heat transfer is very rapid. So we can see that this has a this is going to have a big effect uh, on all processes. And in this case, we prolonged it compared with the previous study because here we have the egg stage up to the first feeding. That was when we had the temperature regime. And then subsequently, everything is raised at the same uh, temperature. So in this particular case, uh, the interest was to ask whether this can modify in any way the response to an immune challenge because disease, the bigger the population of the same species, the higher the risk that we can have disease outbreak and it will spread. Uh, so here is the trial. Uh, Katerina has explained it. We have three temperatures. This again is the sea bus. So I'm only reporting some results on the sea bus. We had the three different temperature regimes for the egg and autotrophic phase. Then they were brought to the same temperature and everything was reared and then moved out into cages uh, where they were held under standard uh, production regime until seven months when we then did the experiment. So the experimental challenge here was to effectively expose the fish since we're in the open sea we don't, and we don't want to bring the fish into land. We want to have them in situ in a normal production setting. Uh, the challenge was using proxies for bacteria and proxies for virus. So these are compounds that simulate an exposure and they fool the fish into thinking it's being exposed, that it's being exposed to a bacterial infection, so that's LPS, or a viral infection, that's polyIC. So this is a polysaccharide in the case of the bacteria, which is like on the surface normally, and this would be the double-stranded RNA or DNA in the case of the virus. And we said, well, sometimes you get the mixture of both. So we have these three situations, bacterial proxy, viral proxy, and the combination of the two. And then what did we do? We sampled the blood and we sampled the spleen. So we have control, unexposed, and then we have exposed. And then we had a time course to follow the response of the fish, its immune response to the presence of these different challenges. This was very challenging. It was done on a boat. Uh, it took a lot of hours to actually set and run the experiment. And I'm very <laughs> grateful to Katerina for doing that with members from my team and her team, and also from the team that actually ran it, HCMS in, the, in Crete. So um, what did we do? So what we tried to do then was to conduct analysis at the level of the biochemistry directed towards indicators of immune response, and analysis at the level of molecular, again, directed at indicators of immune response. And so what I'm showing here is just one small window in terms of how we could probe what's happening in terms of the immune response when we expose it to a virus. So we have two main systems of response in vertebrates, innate, which is, a, in, a, uh, is an innate, it's born with us, it's, a, it's our barriers, it's the production of mucus, it's the, it's the presence of white blood cells. Uh, and so these are always there and present and basically uh, patrolling and protecting the organism. And on the other hand, we have the acquired, and this is the response that requires activation. It's the response we normally aim to activate with vaccines. Uh, so here we wanted to look at this innate immune response, and we wanted to look specifically, in this case, at the antiviral response. And so this schematic is basically summarizing 
how one of a, how a vertebrate cell, and that would be a human cell or a, a fish cell, uh, would respond to the presence of a virus. And the viruses up here, these red round things represent that. So we have a, a set of receptors that recognize these in a relatively low specific, specific way, toll receptor three, and then also nod receptors that also have this role. And they're going to then act when, this is, when there is this process of exposure, this will activate gene transcription, we can get interferons, we can stimulate the, present, the presentation of the antigen from the virus with the major histocompatibility complex. And this is going to end up effectively by the organism trying to kill and eliminate the virus. So this is what we try to do, set up different uh, analytical uh, processes to cater for virus, to cater for bacteria, or the combination of the two challenges. So what did we see? I'm, I'm not even attempt to show you the results because we have run a, a lot of samples and a lot of different uh, molecular markers to look at the response. We had a high replication number to try and account for the variability that exists between fish populations always. Uh, and we had a broad suite of different markers to try and cater as well for physiological changes and for changes that are specifically of the immune response. So this is just an example of the pattern recognition receptor TOLRIS-3. This is that receptor that will recognize the virus and will trigger this response in the host cell. And we have the three temperatures, 14, 17, and 20. And then we have effectively, very simply, these bars represent the, the average and the deviation of these different groups that we had control, non-exposed, LPS exposed, poly ICO exposed, and the combination, 16 to 24 hours. And so uh, there's no statistics on this particular one, but just by looking at the size and the difference in the position, you can appreciate there are some groups that are responding differently to the challenge. So when we put this into a much more complicated situation and we take a statistical program and we take all of the markers and we take all of the individual and their responses and we ask, are there any differences? Uh, and this is what we did with this Permanova statistical analysis. When we pulled this apart and we I've circled here in different colors, clustering of specific groups in terms of responsiveness. The blue triangles and uh, boxes, these are controls. You can see the controls are quite different from the treatment groups. And we can see also that the temperature groups, which are represented by different symbols, are also quite different from the control and quite different from each other. So I know it's a lot to assimilate and <laughs> swallow. It took me quite some time to look at this. But I think that what we can see from this is that actually temperature, because all the yellow triangles sit together, or the orange triangles sit, uh, sit together, it's telling us that that group of 40 de 14 degrees is behaving differently from this square group down at the bottom of the graph uh, that was held at 20 degrees. So this is telling us that these fish that were exposed effectively for five to six days to a different thermal regime, so either 14, 17, or 20, and then reared at the same temperature, when exposed to a challenge of bacteria, or virus or the combination, they had very different responses. So it, uh, of course, we would like to do this with live uh, uh, virus or bacteria to see the pathology, but I think it's telling us that in fact, there is a modification in the, in the immune capacity or the immune competence of these fish by just manipulating the temperature. So my take home message, uh, very simply, uh, it's very similar to Katerina's and to Frances, is that clearly this temperature regime in this experiment during the autotrophic stage in the European sea bass affects the adult basal immune, uh, um, it affects the adult basal immune status and has a profound effect on the response to an immune challenge. The, this larval programming therefore either voluntarily or involuntarily, if you're not very careful with the standard operating procedures and you have big variations during your egg and larval culture, this is going to affect the way your fish perform later on. And that, so that's on one hand. And on the other hand, we can use this to our benefit if we want to 
manipulate without genetically manipulating, without having a genetic selection program, we could use this kind of procedure to better or to manipulate or improve uh, some traits of interest, which might be capacity to respond to a bacterial challenge. So this comes back to this term that Katerina used, this so-called precision farming, uh, that the hatchery could be a place for precision farming. We're moving away from this big genetic selection programs that sometimes give very little gain for very high investment. We're talking here about something which is above the genetics, it's this epigenome, trying to use environment to exploit plasticity, the benefit uh, of production. So I think that, that I will finish that point. Thank everyone for staying with us and, and for joining us. Apologize for my breakdown due to this power cut. Uh, and again, um, thank the funding agencies, the EU that funded Perform Fish, Katerina that has been battling to keep us on track 